Hi people, so at the risk of the background being a distraction, just a little quick explanation. Um, we have the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge there, um, the Royalist poster, so it's kind of rare actually. Um, that sort of poster will be historic, I think, and collectible. And this lady is Fan Bingbing, a Chinese actress. One of my Chinese friends got that poster of her a while back. Um, and it's again, it's probably rare, at least hard to get in this country. Um, yeah, because she knew I liked Chinese women. Anyway, that's um, just don't want those things to be a distraction. So, um, no, I'm, I'm in my bedroom, it's warmer here. So, I want to talk about one particular issue. Um, yes, it's connected to Ukraine, but it's a bit more specific. That is uh, this issue of water boutery in politics. And it, it's a very common um, approach that people take. And if I'm being honest, I've probably done it myself. Um, so it's worth talking about a little bit. A Vietnamese friend of mine, uh, she posted something about this crisis. And it was in Vietnamese, so I didn't know the exact context. But um, it showed a picture of Biden, Putin and Xi three most powerful men in the world. And um, I, I gathered it was about the Ukraine crisis. Um, and she's basically taken a position on neutrality, she said, along with her government. Um, and uh, she and a, a Vietnamese guy got into a bit of water boutery. And the Vietnamese guy posted a picture. He, he's not my friend. He's obviously um someone she knows anyway he posted a picture of that infamous picture of the late colin powell holding the vial at the un to justify the iraq invasion and then there was an article about tony blair and iraq so that's going to be one of the common um sort of retorts of those who want to downplay this or defend putin um but bear in mind they're vietnamese so that that's you know the other side of the world um, but it, it's an approach that I've noticed from people. By the way, somewhere else on the other side of the world, Taiwan, uh, sentimentally, they're obviously very pro-Ukraine for obvious reasons. And I thought it was a good um, diplomatic gesture for President Tsai Ing-wen to light up the Taiwanese parliament in the blue and yellow of the Ukrainian flag. A gesture that's been done around the world. I mean... Obviously, Taiwan's interested because they have similar concerns with what China might do. But anyway, um, on this thing, what about Iraq? Well, let's let's look at that for a minute. Firstly, there's this assumption, and it tends to be common from countries where um, there isn't really democracy, so there is limited freedom in expressing dissent and views. What I mean by that is... There's parts of the world where I think that um, nationalism is stronger and there's this duality of thinking, i.e. Um, you will be attacked not necessarily for your opinion, but your nationality. So he was throwing that at me because I'm British. Oh, you're British, you're criticising Russia. What about Iraq? Now... I'm not going to deny I've probably done it on occasion, but to be honest, it's not a good approach because I think you need to um, challenge people on their own opinions, not on their nationality. So he was assuming that because I'm British, I'm turning it, you know, I'm ignoring that or I'm somehow okay with that. Back to the matter is, of course, in 2003, the Iraq war was the major story. And um, about one million people protested in London. In Rome, there was the largest anti-war demonstration ever seen. Although some of the protests uh, over the last week have been pretty big as well. Uh, there was a huge one in Berlin. But uh, my point is that there's this assumption that if Westerners criticise Russia, they must be okay with everything their governments have done. And that's just a lazy way of thinking. Now, I don't just say, oh, the Iraq war was a disaster. I actively protested at the time. And, you know, I, I was against it at a time when it wasn't easy to be so. I remember me and another lad in my sixth form, 
were very uncomfortable with the Iraq war and we opposed it and we were we got quite a rough time of it. You know, because there was a period in 2003 when there was this patriotic um, sensation going around that if you were against the government's Iraq policy, you were therefore being unpatriotic and you were against the military and so on, which of course was nonsense. Um, and Blair is hardly a Putinist figure, you know, he's not an ultra-nationalist, he's not, he, he was far more respectful to his dissenters than Putin is. Um, but my point is that, you know, I have, I have a record which I can point to that I, I'm consistent about the Iraq war. It, it, there's no way to gloss it over. That was one of the worst foreign policy decisions a British government has ever taken. And it will forever cloud the legacy of Tony Blair. I, I still believe that he was, um, a well above average prime minister who had many significant achievements. But we can't downplay Iraq. I mean, even if you say that the, the removal of Saddam in itself was a good thing, and I personally believe it was, Saddam was a genocidal dictator. Um, I don't think we could deny that the Iraq war was massively damaging to this country's international image. It was immoral because, you know, as, as brutal a dictator as Saddam was, it was the West that started that war. I mean, there's no way around it. That's what happened. We invaded Iraq. That's a historic record. So it's quite easy for Putin apologists to just fall into that and say, well, what about Iraq? Of course, the difference is the Iraq war was to remove Saddam. It wasn't to take Iraq as a territory of the US or the UK. Uh, well, left-wing students might say otherwise. They might say it's neocolonialism. Um, but that is a difference. The Russian policy in Ukraine is specifically motivated by Putin's irredentist worldview that Ukraine has lost Russian territory. Now, that wasn't the Iraq policy. The Iraq policy was there was weapons of mass destruction there. It was, you know, fatally wrong. Um, but I, I think it's a mistake to just compare different conflicts as if they're one and the same. No two wars in the world are exactly the same. Another strategy that, um, you know, people who are always attacking the West will do is they'll, they'll just name check countries. Or, oh, well, what about Syria, Iraq, Libya, Afghanistan? And they'll just name them off as if they're all one and the same. Well, firstly, including Syria in that list is bizarre because the war in Syria began when Bashar Assad um, brutally crushed legitimate protests. You know, that's another difference of Iraq. It was Britain and America started the Iraq war, but in the case of Syria, it was Assad. In the case of Libya, what happened? Uh, the Libyan opposition were demanding and urging um, Western intervention. And again, what you had there was uh, a dictator who was slaughtering his own people, um, who got removed and he died violently. Um, and, you know, in many circles, Gaddafi is a martyr. I don't think he deserves that title. People conveniently forget Gaddafi was a brutal dictator. Um, and, you know, they also conveniently forget that Sarkozy and Cameron were cheered on the streets of Benghazi. Now, of course, Libya um, turned into a very fragmented state of affairs and it still hasn't recovered. Um, I think war should be a last resort. And I don't think it should be something that is ever done lightly. I'm not a pacifist, I think this kind of force is necessary, but, um, you know, we saw from Iraq the damage to international reputation. That's what's happening to Russia now. Putin's policy has utterly damaged Russia's international reputation. I think even China is reluctant to be too um, supportive of Russia this time. They're not going to condemn Russia, but they're also reluctant to be too supportive of Russia. That's significant. Um, but this whataboutery, it would be fine if people were being hypocritical and they were saying, you know, if I was justifying the Iraq war, then they could probably point out and say, well, you know, you invaded a country, why is that okay? And Russia's invaded a country, so what's the difference? Um, 
well, there's differences in the context, but they were both invasions. But I, I suspect that what the boundary is aimed to deflect. That's why I don't really like it. It's aimed to deflect and it's aimed to downplay. So I actually think a lot of Putin apologists are using this strategy because they know, they know that regurgitating Russia's lie is just, it, it's a weak argument. It won't work. So instead they're resorting to what about Iraq? Um, as if that's got anything to do with this. It hasn't. Um, you know, different conflicts, different times, different situations. Um, but just because you condemn one government doesn't mean you're going to uh, have a knee-jerk defense of another. And I still, I still say, you know, the Iraq War was a disaster. Um, you know, we should never have went in there. It was, it was hugely damaging to our international reputation, hugely. And it cost a lot of lives in uh, British servicemen and particularly Iraqi civilians. And it's true that a lot of the deaths in that war weren't from NATO forces. But, um, you know, the bottom line is we, we started the war. So there's no way around that, really. I personally think that um, given what happened with the Arabian Spring, probably the Iraqis would have risen up against Saddam anyway. But that's, you know... Never knew that for sure. Um, okay, we'll wrap this up. But I don't like what about to read, generally speaking. Um, there's times, you know, if people are pushing such hypocrisy, then sometimes what about to read is necessary to challenge that hypocrisy. But I don't really like it as a general approach. And I think that, you know, if you take a position in politics, you have to be consistent. Um, I try to be. Whether I always succeed, I don't know. But I do try. And um, as for, you know, Putin apologists right now, I just think they're unconscionably wrong. I just don't see what argument they have. I mean, they're still trying to insist that Ukraine's being purged of, Nazi of Nazis. Um the approach I take to that, or the, the view I take on that, is Ukraine's a big country in, in European terms. It's a country of 44 million people. It's the largest country in Europe after Russia. Um, of course, there's going to be on some unsavory factions in Ukrainian society. There probably are some neo-Nazis. probably are some far-right types. Um, there's been reports that black Ukrainians, believe it or not, there is a small proportion of black Ukrainians, Afro-Ukrainians, have faced racism on the uh, as they've tried to flee. Um, that's wrong, and you know it will only play into Russia's hand. But you know, the, using that as as a way to smear an entire country to justify an invasion of that country is is abhorrent, absolutely abhorrent. Um, I mean, let's say NATO invaded China. I mean, it won't happen. They'd say it did because of the communist government that, you know, so you're going to smear a whole country and say, well, if a communist government, so that justifies the invasion. Um, I mean, Zelensky himself is Jewish. So if Russia's argument is, well, okay, he's not really the power, he's being controlled. Um, wouldn't it make sense for Russia to therefore support Zelensky as a Jewish guy who's, who's supposedly being held hostage by these Nazis. I mean, Russia's arguments are just absurd when you think about it. And there's people still regurgitating them. Okay, I'm going to wrap this up because honestly, when it comes to Ukraine, there is so much to talk about. But um, for now, I'll wrap this up. Um, I just think that what about in politics is sometimes it's unavoidable, but what you need to do is be consistent. And I would say to anyone who wants to throw at me, you know, the Iraq war or the crimes of the British Empire, whatever else it is, don't assume that because people are criticising one government, they therefore will support everything their own government is doing. That's not the case. It's not the case with me. However, um, 
I will close with this though because I think it's important. You will not find anywhere on earth that is more tolerant um, in terms of dissent than Western liberal democracies. I mean, some of the loudest Putin apologists are in the West right now. They're a, a minority and they're not very popular right now, but they're not being carted off to jail as those brave Russians are who are opposing Putin. So that's why we also need to be wary of false equivalencies. Um, because, I mean, take for example, uh, and I will round up with this, but it's important. You know, I'm hearing a lot of people, a lot of the Putin apologists say, oh, well, the West is being hypocritical by censoring or banning RT. But here's the thing, free speech has never been absolute. And if you have a hostile propaganda outfit of a powerful adversary, which RT is, um, this notion that, oh, well, free speech, just let them continue to promote their lives. That's a naive argument because free speech has always come with responsibility. Now, RT just continues to spread lies. It continues to spread the lies of the Kremlin. So why the hell should they be given a platform to do so? I think it's a silly argument. I mean, it's basically like saying, you know, this network is smearing the West. It's continuing to promote pro-Russian lies. But, you know, you believe in free speech, so give them a platform. But it's different than just two people having different points of view. I mean, this is an organ of the Russian government. It's not just a viewpoint. It's, it is effectively an organ of the Russian government. So this idea we should just give them a platform is just so naive.